Right, so I'd like to introduce um, Sean Fennell, who's in the UCU National Executive. Thank you. OK, yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, can I send my start out to greetings to uh, the brothers and sisters at uh, Wigan from UCU National Executive Committee. A fantastic strike that shows what can be done. Brilliant work. Let's hope we have more of it, actually. This seems to be what we need, not just one or two Wigans. We want a thousand more Wigans, it seems to me, up and down the country. I just want to do, you know, the, the, tonight's uh, meeting is Labour and the fight against austerity. And I want to say a few things just about some thoughts about that, about Labour, uh, first of all. And then I want to say something about our dispute uh, with the University College union dispute um, which happened a few months ago and, and some of the lessons perhaps which are could be gen drawn more generally to, uh, in, in terms of the movement in some respect I think that to say despite all the utter being told every day every week every we possibly can by the press the worst the lowest ever in history of strikes and so on and so forth actually when you look at what's taking place in Britain at the moment so I mean, it's actually rather an exciting place to be a socialist and to be a trade unionist and be an activist I think number one reason, their side are utterly divided and in a mess. Historically, you'll have to go back, I think you have to go to the Corn Lords of the mid 19th century to see the Tory party, the Tory, the party of the boss class being so divided against their own boss class. I mean, the Corn Lords was precisely was that. They stuck their, their enemies against them. There's a debate about how best to make British ruling class more wealthy than they are at this moment of time. That's what the debate about Brexit is. They're divided. They hate each other. I haven't heard the news today to see exactly what's happened in their little party. They're having to work out how the hell they can get out of the shit they've got themselves into. Um, but nevertheless, whatever happens, it only can be good for us because it means more splits, more divisions, which reflects the top of society. The people who, make, who try to do what they do to you in, uh, in Wigan are the ones who are discussing and wrangling and arguing about, how, uh, about uh, Brexit and so on. But the heart of this argument is about how best to take us on, how best to preserve and defend the profitability of their, their class. That is something which I think is exciting to see their side in a mess. The other exciting thing, of course, is what's happened in the Labour Party over the last number of years. The election of Jeremy Corbyn to the leader of the Labour Party is historic for all sorts of different reasons. I know, and I think others are going to say more about this, but I think you've got to say this is somebody who everybody thought wasn't going to win and not only do you win twice he then comes back and almost beats the the government and on a, on a, on a manifesto which really is one of the most left-wing manifestos really in Europe since 1936 France I, mean, I think you have to go back then to see the kind of radical policies uh, which takes place that is a very very exciting prospect for any socialist to be in this moment of time however if there clearly are some some days aren't there and I think first of all the idea that we have to wait I know Jeremy doesn't think this, I know John doesn't think this, but there's some around him who do, certainly inside the trade unions, that we have to wait, that somehow we can't move too quickly or whatever it might be, it's all going to be, Jeremy will make it all right on the night. Now I hope he does. But Jeremy will be the first ones to say, don't just leave it to me. We need a mass movement before we're getting to office. And I think for a number of reasons why we need to fight now. One, because the tax are coming thick and fast now. We can't wait till 2020 because there'll be more people on the dole, there'll be more privatisations, more cuts in our wages, more racism, more divisions if we don't fight now. So it seems to me relatively obvious that we have to fight here and now and we can't wait X amount of years before we get, uh, if and when we get Jeremy elected. But I think there's a second point as well, because if he's any chance to be elected, it's only on the basis that there's going to be more struggle. The kind of left-wing ideas that Corbyn brilliantly uh, put across in his election campaign can only really start to harness the, the mobilisations which can get millions of people out on the streets to vote if there is mass demonstrations, if there are more strikes and so on. The danger is the more passive our class is, the more, uh, more likely are those rotten ideas of division and racism can start to divide us. That's why activity is so, 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 so important. So even on electoral terms, the need for more struggle is not something separate from that. It is crucial if we're going to, to do that. But also, it seems to me, if and hopefully when Jeremy gets elected on that radical manifesto, there's only one, we know what's going to happen. History has told us this. They will not sit back and simply allow him to put through a radical agenda. It's as simple as that. They will, they, the boss class, the media, the press, everybody, will do their utmost to undermine him every way, that, at every step of, 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 of where they can. The only way we will ensure that that radical manifesto gets implemented by a Labour government, again, is through the mass forces that we develop before an election. And so again, it's about how do we marshal those kinds of forces that are going 
only been essential to ensure that a Labour government isn't going to buckle under the first pressure which attacks them and when money floods out of the country and tries to undermine that policy, we have to make sure that we are in a position that we can mobilise to do so. So there are a number of reasons, I think, and I... You know, there are concerns. There's good people around him who have a vision that perhaps we've got to make Jeremy more of sort of a, a prime minister in waiting type approach and keep him away from the demonstrations, keep him away from the picket lines, and so on and so forth. If this policy is pursued, it will be bloody disastrous for the movement as a whole, but actually for the Labour Party in getting Jeremy elected. And I, I think the lessons from last time round was not because he somehow did less of those things, it's precisely because he smelt different to every other politician. He wasn't the same old politician. And the more we try to make Jeremy more like any old other politician to be electable, the more likely people say, what is the point? The same old again. I thought this was different, but it's not. And that's why it's great to see Jeremy again on the demonstration on the National Health Service. I saw him a few weeks ago. He's my constituency MP. He helped, helped me defend a carpentry department which I was involved in my college which they wanted to shut. It's those kinds of things, more campaigning, we need to be doing. But when we look at the retentionalities, I start with the divisions inside our class, then clearly we have to say, although the potential is there, unfortunately, present company excluded, of course, <laughs> the leadership of our movement have really failed quite, quite catastrophically over the last five, six, six years, seven, eight years, really. You know, I look at the Unison's, Unison's leadership, um, team, Unite's leadership. These people have millions of union members. We see the potential power they have if we come at least, and the members will follow and will fight when they give a lead. Unfortunately, they have not done this. And that, really, in the situation, we should be making hay when their side, in so divisive and so confused way, we could really be not only stopping more privatisation, but going on the offensive, demanding pay rises, demanding better quality of life for everybody through our collective power, the six million workers which are in trade unions at this uh, moment of time. And, and I think this is I know, part of the reason why they're so concerned about doing this was, of course, the trade union laws. They're concerned that somehow the trade union laws now have shackled us, that we can't get majority votes and so on and so on. It's not like they were doing these things before the trade union laws, by the way. Or, interestingly, it's not like you've, thousands of years you've been having ballots and strikes, but now, just because of trade union laws, they haven't been doing so. Um, clearly isn't the case. But I do think... Um, it, it, it is a mistake to think this. I know from own union, I just now say something about this. You know, our experience in University College Union over the last number has been quite incredible. We are talking about a union in transformation here. We've recruited 16,000 new members, and we've had so many ridiculous arguments in our bloody union about, oh, well, is it credit cards? How can we attract more members? And we've said, it's simple. Get some strikes going. Make sure the leadership are fighting over things. And guess what? Strangely, people have joined. And the biggest recruit we've ever had, is, it comes about with the biggest industrial action we've ever taken in the history of, of the union. That's how you build unions. And then when we go through that, that, that strategy, it is very, we're again, national ballot in higher education over the question of pensions, a 58% turnout and a 80% 80, 80 vote for strike action. In the sector I work in, which is further education, we had 12 colleges coordinated for pay and conditions. We got a 64% turnout across the board and a 94% vote for action. And it also escalating action. I mean, I've just finished doing an eight days strike action where we won casualisation to stop casualisation in my workplace and a percentage pay rise and so on as a stepping stone victory to, to, to wider things. And also, interestingly, they're so desperate to call for the strike, they actually said we won't deduct the last three days' strike either, which was quite a nice little, uh, little gift which we, which we had. All colleges have won something because they've taken action. And what is interesting, because the employers are so unused to taking, taking on trade unions, because we haven't fought against them in this way before, they're bloody useless. We can run rings around them. Absolutely, they're, they're fraught with confusion. They don't know how to do it. Don't get me wrong, a few more of it, they learn, like we learn. But at the moment, we are, again, making hay. They are not used. A few demos are excellent, but they can deal with that. I tell you, mass strike action, they really don't know what to do about it. It confuses them, they wobble over the place, and we can really uh, force home a number of victories, which I say numbers have done. But when I look at the higher education dispute, and I'll just I'll finish on this, why it's transformed, it was incredible. 14 days of strike action. You saw mass pickets, literally mass pickets of 200, 300, 400 strong. You saw strike committees running on a daily basis, meeting and organising those strikes. Young people you know, in their 20s and younger joining uh, the, the, the trade unions and coming actively involved in, in, in it. And of course, what happens when you let the genie of working class struggle out of the bottle, it doesn't want to go back again. 
And, they, and the trade union leaders, I mean, we look, there's a big battle around union, who controls the union, the two souls of trade unionism. Is it the rank and file, or is it the trade union bureaucracy? So when they first attempted to sell a, sell a pass on the uh, pensions dispute, a thousand lecturers, young ones, old ones, casualised ones, turned outside the headquarters of the National Executive Committee, chanting, saying, no capitulation, led, led by somebody for UCL who got a hashtag, no capitulation. It went viral overnight and literally caught 40 odd branches met across the country the next day. Mass pickets were formed, old fashioned hands, hands up type meetings. It reminds you much more of the 1970s than anything I've ever seen in the 30 odd five years odd I've been involved in social and trade union politics. So you see, and of course, they had to retreat. They came back for it and they did manage to, 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 to force it back. And we did win something. And there's a debate in our own union. Some think, oh, we lost everything. We didn't lose anything. We did, we, they did force the employers back. People rightly are angry. We could have pushed the employers into the sea. That's what we could have done. In fact, we allowed them to let them hook to regroup, to reorganise and so on. But nevertheless, we're still there. We're still fighting. When it came to Congress, our National Union Congress, amazing thing happened. They decided there's two motions on there, two, one calling for the resignation of the General Secretary and the other was for censure of the General Secretary. You can debate these things, you thought. You know, you might agree, you maybe not. The Unite Union, which organised the staff, you know, hoodwinked by the General Secretary, who also happens to be a Unite member, decided to say, well, we can't do this because this, this is an attack on conditions of membership of, of our staff, and walked out of Congress, not once, not twice, but three times, every time Congress voted, voted to say well, we want uh, to discuss this, they walked out and completely smashed the conference and stopped, stopped it. No motions were discussed what, whatsoever. But what was interesting about it, what people didn't do, just sat there, got so we, people leapt up, said, we are staying here, the majority of delegates stayed in the room and started to debate, not an official insight, and started to say, right, let's have this motion discussed, let's have debate these issues, and so on. And we launched a campaign after that from that Congress say we want these motions discussed. Find out last week what's happened, they've all backed down. Now, now the, the United Union, even, even the United officials, the National Union have told our officials, I hope you're following me on this one, uh, that uh, uh, you won't be having a ballot on this one, it's illegal. And I said, the officials doing over the officials, but I write irony there. I must admit, I was running around Congress at the time looking for a judge to find to get an injunction out. <laughs> You can never find the buggers when you want one, can you? You know what I mean? Um, so the point being is this. You saw the return of the rank and file, and this is the last sentence, the return of the rank and file is a real one. We've been working out and thinking, me and Candle, how we have independent organisation. We're so million miles away. For, we can't suck a rank and file out of your thumb. All is true. But when things start to move in this particularly precarious situation, the class moves so quickly, and us activists are on the heels of the class, and therefore you can start to see what can constitute a real independent rank of our organisation overnight. If it can happen in a lecturers' union, by the way, hardly known as the most militant sections of the working class, but it is now, God knows what it could be done in unison or Ten Chichin or anywhere else for that matter. So struggle is absolutely there. The headline for niggas, let's not get too panicky about it. It's underneath the surface is not only people wanting to fight, but the, 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 the potential to build independent rank of file organisation linked to the campaign to get Jeremy Linkler to, 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 into, into office is a real one and one which we can, uh, I think, excitedly uh, campaign for. Our next speaker today is Ian Hodgson from the Bakers Union. Near me. Hey! <laughs> Always. Listen, congratulations to the people of Wigan. I'll tell you, managers, managers of Wigan beware. When Wiganers stand up, they better bring their clogs because Wiganers always win, you know. Congratulations. You know, I went to Believe Square when they had their rally. It was an amazing. I even sang, uh, but I'll try not to do that today. Uh, and I'll try to avoid the jokes because I've been doing a little bit of stand up recently. Um, some people said it was funny. Um, <laughs> but obviously, they, they soon changed seats. Um, listen, it's always a pleasure to come to Marxism. It's always a pleasure uh, to be invited to speak in uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, meetings that, that are held here. Uh, it's always great to see so many socialists 
in one room. Socialists is a word we can now use and no longer look, look, people look down our nose at that because now they understand what socialism is. And now we understand not only can we be socialists but we can be working class and proud too. You know, we now have the Labour Party talking about the fact that the working class is back, the working class is there, it's always been there, it's never been away, you know, but now we can talk about the working class issues and the issues that we face as people, as working class people that come from a community that earn our living in the places where we live. Something that people sometimes in politics seem to forget that we ever actually existed in the first place and that's why they do politics to us instead of with us and for us. And Joe, what we've seen... What we've seen under Jeremy Corbyn for the first time is a leader that understands, and there's a reason why he understands. There's a reason why he understands. He was brought up in the trade union movement. He's never been far away from the people that he represented in his constituency, and he's always stood with working people when they're in strife and when they're in struggle, so he understands exactly the people who he is representing. He recognises the importance of the people that live in every community, regardless of their race, of their gender, of their faith, of their religion, of, of any, any diversity whatsoever. You know, he understands that we win when we stand together in solidarity. And, you know, what we have to understand too, and, it's, and you know, and I agree with Sean, that, you know, the, the idea that we have to wait for a Labour government to make these changes that may come in 2020, hopefully before. I believe she's having a pyjama party this weekend. Uh, and the Cabinet's all going to be there. Um, <laughs> I think Bozo's going with his teddy bear. Because um, I don't know whether he's going to attend the main meeting or the, uh, be in the... Uh, in the childcare room, waiting for uh, Rhys Mogg to come and give him a bit of a, a, bit of a cuddle. Um, but obviously, um, you know, they're going to be there planning and plotting about how they're going to destroy workers' rights uh, after Brexit. Now, some people think Brexit is, um, is the problem. Well, actually, I've never thought Brexit is the problem. I don't believe in Brexit. I always supported Lexit. Um, but... <laughs> but... The issue, the issue that we've faced as trade unions is quite clear. And it's something that we've been facing, actually, being members of the European Union, isn't it? I mean, we've watched the decline of trade union membership. We've watched the removal of workers' rights. We've watched the race to the bottom in every industry and zero-hours contracts rise while we've been members of the European Union. You know, we keep getting told it's legislation that protects us. We keep getting told it's only by having laws in place that we can have our rights. Well, you know what? Slavery was legal once. <laughs> Slavery was legal once. That was enshrined in legislation. You know, if we rely on legislation, it doesn't necessarily mean it will always be there to protect us. And it doesn't always mean it will be there to serve us and make sure that we receive justice. It just makes sure that they maintain their power and their influence to take control and rule over us. And that's why, as much as it's important that we have a Labour leader and a Labour you know, shadow cabinet that understands working class people and recognises socialism is the right approach, it's the people in this country that need to be mobilised and it's the movement that we need to build because that's the role that we have to play in this room. That's the role that we have to play here today and, after, and every day when we move away from here because it can't just be while you're at Marxism or when you go to a union conference. It has to be every day. It has to be every day of talking. Now, I once got into trouble in the Daily Mail for saying this particular quote, but just to clarify if there is any Daily Mail, but I don't know whether they'd pay the tickets for Marxism, but if there is, when I talk about, about going into school playgrounds, I'm not about talking to the adults who pick the children up, right? Just, just for clarity, yeah? So when I say, you know, talk to the, talk to the adults in the playground to pick the children up, uh, and say, you know, it does, the system doesn't have to be like this. We don't have to accept sure start shutting down. We don't have to accept libraries closing. We don't have to accept, you know, that the, our NHS gets privatised because we can stand up and we can do something about it. Because we can. And we've always been able to. We just thought that if we were confrontational, that somehow that would make matters worse. Somehow, by rolling up and getting a kick in, they'd stop kicking us. Well, you know, they never will. There's only one way to win, and that's to be confrontational. 
We have to confront them. We've always been taught that when the bully hits you in the playground, you stand up and you don't take the bully in. You stand up to that bully and you make that bully stop. It's the only way. And it's the only way we can change our lives is when we stand up together and we make the change because we demand it. And I say this at a lot of places where I go and speak. When you look at the things we have achieved in our history and we always need to remember the things that we have achieved because as people, as people we've always been in struggle, we've always had to fight. It's never come easy because if it was then it wouldn't be a struggle. You know, when it is the, the right for men to vote, the right for women to vote, and we're selling, celebrating all these rights this year. There's so many celebrations going on across the country for different reasons. You know, we celebrated our 100th conference, even though we've been around since 1847. <laughs> that conference to us was very important. Because that year that we held that conference, although it was 1914, and I know people are going to say, well, that's not 100 years ago, that's why it was the 100th conference, not 100 years. Right? But that conference was quite significant because we stopped talking around the idea of skills and started talking around, it, around the ideas of class. Because that's what we are. We are a class trade union and we are a class movement. And we should never forget that. Because that's essentially the parts that are important to us to remember to unite the individuals in our communities and our society. Because let's be clear, when we want to talk about socialism and they throw this, oh, you know, show me a country where socialism has worked. Well, we could talk about some of the social economic, you know, countries in the world that have socialism. We could even say, oh, we could throw China in. That's one of the most successful countries in the world. But we don't need to. We don't need to justify their argument. Because if you want to see the successes of socialism, I'll give you three letters. N-H-S. There's socialism at work for you. That's socialism. That's what socialism's all about. It's about improving people's lives because not based on your ability to pay for it, but on your ability for need. You know? I mean, it's always been true and it's always been said. You know, the problem with the working class sometimes is the leaders that we elect or put in place don't believe in the things that we want or need. They don't believe that we have the right to actually have a voice. But you know, when we do have leaders that recognise how important when we are, when we do have leaders that understand that communities and the people up and down this country, regardless of your background, regardless whether you were born here or born abroad, have a contribution to make to our society. When those leaders recognise that, then they will get the opportunity to lead us to the place where we all belong to be. And that's in government. And that's changing the society. So when we see the Football Lads Association on the streets, you know, and let's not be worried about the FLA. Let's, do, let's make our own Football Lads Association if we must. Let's form one and say, actually FA, you know, if the FA wants to be really real about, about racism, never mind the campaign that says, show racism the red card, Let's stop them allowing companies that use newspapers like The Sun or allow them to exploit workers from sponsoring football events. Let the FA stand up and say, you know, if you support some of these atrocities happening in America because you're a McDonald's corporation or another corporation and you've helped fund some of those events that Donald Trump has supported, then no longer we will allow you to actually sponsor football events over here. Don't say rhetoric, take action. Let the FA demonstrate that it's committed to kicking racism out and also let it say this, if you're a member of that organisation that goes around and demonising people in our society, you will be banned from football grounds and you won't be allowed anywhere near them too. Because the way we unite together, you know, is not by just opposing them on the streets, it's by saying to people, the reality is this, the issues that we face are this. The hardships that we have in our lives have never been caused by some poor person from another country. They've been caused by people in offices, in boardrooms, politicians in cabinet offices, making decisions that enabled corporations to reduce people's pay, to introduce zero hour contracts. Those are the reasons we have hardship, and never ever was that caused by a Polish person, a Romanian person, anybody from India or Pakistan. It was caused by politicians making decisions in the interests of the few. Never, 
ever did anybody come here and decide to sell off our council houses and stop building them. That was a decision by the Tory government. That was a decision by Thatcher carried on by Labour and recently under austerity completely stopped under the Tories. And the reason why there's no decent homes isn't because people have already took them, it's because they haven't made them, they haven't created them, and actually they wouldn't even pass legislation that said that we were entitled to them. So that's the reason why it's never been caused by anybody coming here. In fact, all they've ever done is contributed to the improvements that we see in our society, whether it's food that we all enjoy, whether it's the socialising in the evenings, whether it's any of the things that we now take for granted and actually call Britishness. You know, a curry's British, isn't it? You know, when we go out on a, on a Friday or a Saturday night, we go for a kebab. You know, it's British, that, isn't it? I mean, you know, I mean, the reality is this. We've never been a country that never had migration. You know, apart from maybe the, the people, that are, the neighbours that, that washed up on the street, uh, on the shores at some point, and, you know, in, in, uh, in the far-flung era of when the earth was being created. Because the reality is, that we're all migrants and that's where we all originate from. So when we understand our strength is in unity, when we understand that we build a movement on solidarity, when we understand that the changes are made because we demand them, and when we stand together and achieve that, then we will be able to get to the place that we all deserve to be, solidarity. Thank you very much. And our next speaker today is Karen Reisman, and she is a member of the Socialist Workers' Party and on um, the Unison National um, Executive, but is speaking in a personal capacity. <laughs> you always have to say that when you're in Unison. Uh, I want to start with the fact that we have the worst attacks on working class people's living standards virtually in history, in terms of capitalist history. I think it's the 1870s since it's been as bad as this. And yet we still have a Tory government sort of tearing themselves apart but clinging on to power. And I want to say there's two big reasons why that's the case. One is, although they hate each other's guts and tear themselves apart, one of the things that they agree on is the thought of having Jeremy Corbyn in power, in government, or in government rather than in power, right, fills them with dread, absolute dread. But the second reason why they get away with it is because alongside the worst attacks on, on people's living standards is we have the lowest amount of class struggle that we've had for years and years and years as well. And that combination allows them to get away with it. It allows them to carry on attacking us year after year. And I think because of those attacks that we've seen not just in Britain but right across the world, you've seen a growth in left-wing parties, often independent ones like Syriza or Podemos, but in Britain we saw a re birth really almost of the Labour Party and it's sort of in the shell of the old Labour Party which was sort of you know being killed off first slowly and surely by, uh, by Blair. A regrowth of a left wing uh, uh, movement within that party and there is no doubt when that happened that that boosted left wing sort of confidence right across Britain where suddenly you could feel proud to be a socialist and you weren't on your own. You could feel like other people wanted it too, like there was a movement that you could be part of. You know the Labour Party now has 500,000 members so something it's not had for years and years. And it's absolutely fantastic that that's existed. And I think the SWP is absolutely clear. We want a Corbyn government and we will be part of the fight to get that Corbyn government. But one of the things that I suppose I want to say as well is that it's not just about whether we want that Corbyn government or not. I think it's also about we've got radical policies, we've got a mass membership within the Labour Party, but how are we going to actually win the things that are in that manifesto? How are we going to, uh, to increase it? Because there is no doubt that even though Corbyn election boosted people's confidence, the time when people feel most able to challenge the way the world is, is when they do the Wiggins of this world or the UCUs of this world, and they experience somehow you spend your working life being told you shit and feeling like shit, you stand on a picket line alongside a few hundred other people, and suddenly you don't feel like shit anymore. You feel like 
actually who's going to do my job? Not the people at the top on the mill, because there isn't enough of them. There isn't enough of them to do our job. Actually, we have an enormous amount of power. And we begin to see what the media is like, we begin to see what the laws are like, and they're not equal. They don't treat us equally. And you get the confidence to begin to challenge because you're part of a movement. You have to, to survive, go out and speak. Dave has to come here today. Not because he necessarily thinks, oh, it's great, I'm going to do it. At first, it's like, oh my God, oh my God. You come and you think, actually, I can do it. I'm not stupid. I can speak. It's great. And you begin to get that confidence. Struggle changes people. It changes working class people. So the beliefs about you need somebody else to do it for you is, uh, is thrown away. And the problem is, is that the Wiggins of this world and the UCUs of this world are absolutely fantastic. I couldn't believe it when I heard that Wigan weren't going to go ahead with the private company, but they've abandoned that. And that is to the credit of the people who fought to do that. And it's not because working class people don't want to fight. You look at the NHS pay dispute. Most of the unions said, you've got a brilliant offer here, you should accept it, you know, we're not going to fight, do you want to accept it? And 80% of those unions, on average, voted uh, to accept the deal. One union, GMB, said, actually, it's not a very good offer, it's better than the 1%, and actually, we only got rid of the 1% because of a fairly minor action, which is an indication of how weak the Tories are. It doesn't actually take very much. Nine days of strike action at Wigan and a determination to do more if we need to has made them back down. It doesn't take very much to get rid of the 1%. 1%. A few rallies primarily run by the RCN, not known for their most radical trade unionism, and we now get 3%, but loads of strings and loads of shit. The union says there's loads of strings you could do a lot better. Gets an 80%, yes we can and we're prepared to fight. So it's not because workers don't want to fight, it's because they're not confident necessarily about going ahead without their unions, and the union leaders are tied into the system. And in some ways, the better the Labour manifesto is, the more radical and the more left-wing it is, the more it feels feels like that's a good bet. You know, do you put your money on Dave Prentice and I think I'm going to rely on him to win me a pay rise? Or do you put your money on Corbyn and think, actually, I think I'll do a bit better under him? And I think people are saying, well, let's just wait for Labour because that's the better chance of doing it. That's what we have to do. That the trade unions don't inspire us uh, uh, in the way that they're going unless they're sort of, you know, unless there are people on the ground or people who are fighting. And that's where I think we do make a difference. And I don't think we can just write off that because I don't think people are confident about change. But I do think, given a lead, given some support, then they will. And I think, you see, I think that, that there are loads of people in the Labour Party, just like there are loads of people in the SWP, in fact, all of us, who want there to be more class struggle. It's not the case that most of the people have joined the Labour Party just thinking, well, I'll wait till 2022, that'll do, that'll be all right. People want to fight, they want to do the demonstrations, they want to do the strike, they support and applaud the people who do it. I think the difference is, is that in a way that the Labour Party itself was created for elections, it was created for, gov for government, and it was set up, it's set up to how you elect your MPs, all the organisation is around MPs, constituencies and wards and about motions and about sort of, you know, how to pass policies. But really, right, the people who are in the Labour Party have to do a balance between all the internal stuff of now endless meetings and sort of motions and pre-meetings and caucuses and ward meetings and getting people in and in order to try and deselect and reselect the people that we want in order to implement the manifesto that we think is good and to get stuff into it. There's all that pressure pressure of what to do and there's the pressure of going out on the streets and organising the collections for Wiggins and doing the street stalls and raising the issues of racism and going on the anti-Trump demo and I think when class struggle is low that balance between how much of what you do is shifted towards some of the stuff in terms of the internal Labour Party and a lot of the 500,000 the enthusiastic people who love what Wigan did who love what the UCU do who love Ian Hobson because you can't help but right are also pulled into not doing that most of the time and I think that's a problem for us and I think us in the SWP can be pulled by that too because we're not only just not wanting to wait for an election we don't want to wait for struggle to just appear either we have to be some of the architects of making that struggle happen those Wigans can happen in other places too but sometimes I think we give up on thinking that that's possible we think we can't fight and sometimes you can't fight and you can't win I'm not saying that you can win it all but if you don't try if you don't have a go if you don't do that stuff I guarantee you won't win and I guarantee that you won't build anything uh, uh, anything uh, out of doing that and I think that means that we do have to be the people the people who 
say to, to Jeremy Corbyn, who I think has been sort of subdued by being the shadow leader, the, the, the shadow, the prime minister in, in waiting. I think he has been subdued by that. Why does he have to stop being the leader of Stop the War? I want my prime minister to be a leader of Stop the War. Why does he not think that he can say, you know, OK, you voted Brexit, let's fight for a workers' Brexit and I'm going to go around the country and organise meetings to fight for what a real Brexit that makes a difference to ordinary workers rather than the different debates that are going on that bear no relation to what you and me want. Why is this sort of, you know, why have they softened their stance at a time when you have the worst example of street racism and the worst example of institutional racism in my lifetime? You've got fascists out on the streets building bigger demonstrations than we've seen for years, probably in my lifetime, actually. I don't remember in the 70s seeing 20, sort of 15,000 people out. And yet, sort of, you know, thinking of this is a time in which to make compromises about being soft on freedom of movement, to be soft on the, um, I mean, in my union, suggests that we actually should have humane immigration laws, as if somehow that's, uh, that's possible. And I do think that, you know, that, that we want a better lead from them, but we, we actually have to be part of helping to shift that and make that happen. Because it won't be, when they come for Corbyn, and undoubtedly they will come for Corbyn, uh, they already are doing it now, and I think people have risen to the occasion and come and defended him in the main, and I think that's been fantastic to see. But this is nothing to what will happen if he is actually uh, um, elected. I do think we have to have, it won't be the motions, it won't be the Maud meetings, it won't be all those hours you spend in meetings that make a difference as to whether or not he is shifts and pulls to the left. It will be whether there are demonstrations, whether there are strikes, whether there are mobilisations, small or big, in each of that. And you look at, you look at the Windrush response, you know, Diane Abbott, ground down by, um, by the attacks, vicious, horrible, nasty, racist sort of, you know, really awful and it's hard to sustain that but when you see the response to Windrush and you see people standing up and fighting it gives her the confidence to come back out fighting and to come and say yeah you know I am holding my line I am going to fight my corner when the response to Grenfell was mass mobilizations on the street people saying we are not letting our people die in the name of profit housing became a public issue capitalism became a public issue and the market and how it kills us and it gave people confidence and it gives the politicians confidence to see that and I do think, you know, we can't just cheerlead um, Jeremy Corbyn. We can't just look at the internal fights that go on in the Labour Party. And we can't just wait for struggle. We have to be the people who are arguing at work about open borders, who are taking petitions, who are organising those street cells. Every single person who's done collections for Wigan will feel a part of the victory, will feel partly that they helped to shape that, and will feel bigger and stronger as a result of the victory that they've had, uh, that they've had today. And I do think that, you know, that, that even the stuff about how do you win that fight, getting the Wigan strikers to come out and do the collections around Unison Conference, which they weren't confident about doing, getting them to do it on the NHS demo, getting them to feel the support that they've got. We have a left-wing union in the northwest region, and they didn't even put out a demand for, for donations and where to send them to until three days ago, despite the fact that, you know, that the dispute's been going on for, uh, for eight weeks. And I I think we can make a difference in making that happen and I think we did make a difference in in making some of that happen and I think that in a way we have we have a decision to make about where our priority is and how we orientate. And I think currently we have to say we are not waiting for labour, we are not waiting for struggle, we are going to attempt to stir up and generate the 80% of GMB members, and I'm sure the 80% of Unison and other members who want to fight given a chance. We want to try and create opportunities for them to organise. We want them on the Trump demo. We want them to understand the arguments about racism. We want them to come and stand up and oppose and sadly we do have to oppose the FLA on the streets of the DLF because they're not going to go away without us doing that and we have to mobilise wider forces and every pe person that we bring with us on that, every person that we win to doing that, every time people move outwards and organise and engage in struggle, we're one chance nearer creating victories that then can become the domino effect. How many other uh, organisations in the NHS that are facing being privatised out will take heart by the victory at, uh, at Wigan and 
we have to make sure not just that they've had the victory at Wigan, but all those other people know about it in the health service and out. You can fight, you can win. And actually, as part of that, you begin to create a society that makes a Corbyn election nearer, quicker, and when he gets in, better able to fight the onslaught that we get. And that's why I'm in the SWP, and I think anybody who isn't in this room should join it too. Thanks, comrades. I, um, I attended a, a meeting in Liverpool last week called by the Fire Brigade Union in response to a new wave uh, of cuts which has just been announced uh, in Liverpool. Now, already um, there's been massive cuts. The number of appliances that the fire service, has, the fire service in Liverpool had has been reduced from 42 to 28. That means, in reality, that if there's a house fire in Liverpool now, whereas they would have normally have sent two appliances to put that out, they only send one. That means that firefighters then have to make a decision whether to fight a fire in the house or if there's people in the house to try and rescue them. There's only, they can only do one of them two things. That's the reality that the choices, uh, the, the, the choices that fi fire, uh, firefighters are, are being left. If my local uh, fire station in the north end of Liverpool now closes at 8 o'clock at night, it now means that uh, the next uh, station, I think, is about four miles away. The reality of that means that um, deaths uh, in Liverpool due to fires have now tripled um, in the last couple of years. The new wave of cuts, uh, which, which has been announced, includes the closure of another major local fire station in the centre um, of Liverpool. There's massive anger over this. Uh, and the meeting last week was absolute, absolutely packed out. On top of that, one, one, of, one of the cuts which has been um, pushed onto, 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 the, onto the fire brigade, onto the FBU, is that if members of the FBU are prepared to never strike under any circumstances, that they will be given an extra £1,000 a year. That's bad enough. But this has been pushed by a Labour-controlled fire authority. So there's massive anger over it, but the emphasis in terms of what you do about it was the arguments about it on, on the floor were about what we really need to do now is elect more local councillors, more councillors on, on, on these particular bodies which control the fire service, wait for Corbyn. In fact, the guy who was chair in the meeting from the FBU specifically made the point about Grenfell. He said there's massive anger about how the Tories are trying to blame the firefighters within the Fire Brigade Union and the public about what happened to Grenfell. His argument was, now is not the time to fight while the inquiry of Grenfell is going on because it would do an injustice to the people at Grenfell. I actually thought that was quite shameful, to be quite honest. There's never been a better time for fight. When, when the, um, they were on strike a couple of years ago with the pensions disputes, I can remember an old lady going past, we were collecting for them, and she put her money, in, put her money in, into the book, and she said, I hope you get your pay rise. And the firefighter said, it's not about a pay rise. It's about that. She said, it doesn't matter to me what it's about. You're our fire service, and you deserve our support. There's massive support out there. We can't wait for, for local Labour councils. We can't wait for the election of COBE. There's massive anger out there about what's happening with our fire brigades and all the rest. We have to fight now. Yeah, I've just got a question, really. Um that hundreds and thousands of people joined the Labour Party to support Corbyn, to vote for Corbyn as leader, to canvass uh, in the election last year and came close to delivering a, an election victory. What I want to know is how can we pull them closer to extra parliamentary activity such as the immediate threat we've got of Trump visiting a week tomorrow, a week today, and the fascists and racists marching in London a week tomorrow, because I'm in Norwich, I'm in Norwich SWP, and we've, we've organised with Stop the War Coalition, the local Greens, Quakers, Friends of the Earth, um, Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, a coalition called Together Against Trump to match the Nationals together against Trump movement. 
we're organising a coach down to the London demo, which we've sold nearly all the tickets for, which is good. And we've organised a local rally for people who work so that they can come along after work half five on Friday. The local Labour Party are having their AGM a week today. And they're focusing on that AGM. And I'm just scratching my head thinking, how can you think that a Labour Party AGM is more important than protesting against the biggest threat to peace and world stability we've ever seen in this world? Um, so the question is, we need to tap into those people. And a lot of them are ex-comrades, ex-SWP members. I know plenty who have dropped out and, and then joined the Labour Party and got really behind Corbyn and have all the right words and all the right moves. But how do we engage with them and drag them out into the streets with us? Because we need them on our own. We're not going to win. We're not going to beat the fascists. And they could potentially destroy all of that. Comrades, last week in the House of Commons, Esther McVeigh had to apologise to the House of Commons because she got it wrong. Because universal credit is no good at all. And I'll tell you now, the National Audit Office has said and told this government that universal credit does not work. What we need to be doing, get our trade unions together, along with the NHS, along with all the people, on mental health, on social care, social housing, we need to bring all the people together, keep the campaign going, because it's important, because this government is destroying the people, it's destroying children, our schools, and everything. We have got nothing left but ourselves and our support that what we have. And I'm telling you now, we've got to get the trade unions involved. We've got to be involved ourselves. We must come together to help our families, to help our children, to give our older people a bit of respect. And let's put this country back on the map and the NHS where it should be. Yeah, uh, Tom Ashtangley Evans from uh, Socialist Worker uh, newspaper. I think uh, Wigan is important if you're a health worker because the bosses are trying to push through a dangerous new form of privatisation with the wholly owned subsidiaries, not just in Wigan, but also in North Derbyshire, in West Yorkshire, and other places. And if you can stop it in Wigan, the argument is the bosses are now on the back foot, they're not going to want to push it through, and if, those, if workers in those places even announced strikes, I think they would back off straight away, and this would be a major setback for these sorts of plans. I mean, just think about it. We've had victories where people have been brought back in-house, but to actually stop privatisation going through in the first place is something that is majorly significant. But it's not just important if you're in the NHS. I think this is significant for the whole working class movement within uh, Britain, because there is an argument, as the Speaker said, which is, how do we actually stop the Tories' attacks and get change? And I think Corbyn has a, very, has a contradictory effect on the trade union movement. On the one hand, more people are interested in socialist ideas, think that t ideas of just £10 an hour isn't just a good idea, but it's something that we can actually attain and we can get change. But at the same time, there's also the argument that one should wait until the election. And that's the argument coming from the likes of Dave Prentice, leader of Houston. Essentially, we can have some fights now, and he, credit, he did back the Wigan dispute, but essentially, if you want to win a national pay rise, if you want to stop the broader attacks, you've got to wait till the election. Well, what Wigan shows is that, one, it is right to fight now. If you want to stop privatisation, you don't just have to wait for a Labour government. You can do it now. But also that when it comes to the fights now, that it, they're important in terms of bolstering the left of the Labour Party, bolstering Corbyn, but it also points to a much bigger change that people can get. Because, you know, strikes uh, are important because they... they 
have a particular power to beat back uh, attacks. But for me, covering that dispute actually confirmed a lot of the things that we as revolutionaries say about strikes. You know, every day, working class people are told that they're too stupid, too selfish to have a say over anything. When you go on strike, you see your collective power to actually take on the bosses, and it raises bigger questions. Why is this that in the National Health Service, it is run by the likes of Foster, the likes of the chief executives, and uh, uh, Jeremy Hunt, and instead of being run by the porters, the cleaners, the doctors, the nurses who actually uh, know uh, how to run the health service. And therefore, when it comes to strikes, it shows the power of working class people not only to take on the bosses, but to say we can have a much bigger vision of transforming society altogether where we're the ones who are in charge. So we need to take this victory in Wigan, take it into our workplaces and say this shows we can fight now and it also shows the potential that working class people have power and we don't have to listen to their lies about how we are powerless and uh, uh, and they're the ones who run everything, because actually it shows that we have the power to run society. Yes, when we talk about austerity, I think we've got to mention the flagship policy of austerity, which was the benefit sanctions. I thought we'd agree with the party that in terms of campaigning, we'd have posters saying, scrap universal credit, stop all benefit sanctions now. Which, but since the most you know, evil policy you can see in terms of the clause of the welfare re 2012 Welfare Reform Act will increase the maximum level of sanction from six months to th th three, three years, which basically is a murderous policy and it's had the desired murderous effect. Thousands of pe people are being driven to their, to their deaths. In terms of the hostile environment that the Windrush generation have faced, that's also been faced by the poor, the sick and the disabled who have been subjected to this, to this mur murderous re regime and we need to be campaigning about it. If we don't raise this issue ourselves, how can we put pressure on the Labour Party to change the policy from Paul's universal credit to one of scrapping it straight away? In terms of the... the, the, the and in terms of the benefit sanctions, it's, it's the most visible effect of austerity. The number of people sleeping rough on the streets, the step change happened since 2010. That's why you can't walk 20 metres or drink outside a pub without being hassled every few minutes by people being forced into that level of destitution. And, okay, and universal credit jacks up the level of, of uh, attacks on the people. The, the sanctions rate is, in, is going to increase. So we need to be out there campaigning. And the thing about it as well, we can win on this. It's a, it's a slow motion car crash happening. The, the, only, it's only affecting one million people so far and they can't implement it. To, like combine, replace six benefits with one benefit without other glitches. They can't even do it for a million people. They want to apply it to six, seven, eight million people and affect the working poor. They'll be subject to harassment, increase their hours. This is an issue we can win on and we should be, we should be putting more um, pressure on, on, the, on this issue. So finally, stop all the benefit sanctions, scrap universal credit now. Hello. Um, I wanted to talk about this idea about waiting for Labour because I think it's something that we, we say quite a lot and we hear said quite a lot, but I think uh, maybe it's, it's slightly unfair. I don't think anyone in the Labour Party, realistically, or certainly not uh, members that we work with at the grassroots level, actually talk about waiting for the Labour Party to get elected. I don't think anybody puts it in those terms. I think it's a lot more subtle than that. I think it starts when uh, activists... In, uh, in campaigns and, and union members, I've seen it in my own union, I'm a, I'm a rep in the National Education Union, start getting involved in the machinery. They, you know, they join the Labour Party very enthusiastic about Corbyn and stuff, and then they start getting involved in the machinery uh, of the Labour Party. And uh, unfortunately, as we all know, time for working class people under capitalism is a very limited resource, isn't it? And so what happens is that with those limited resources, they end up uh, prioritising elections rather than struggle on the ground. Um, and, you know, I think it would be absolutely fantastic, don't get me wrong, it'd be brilliant if Jeremy Corbyn was elected, and I think we'd all celebrate that massively, but I have to say, really, that I, I agree with Jane. I think if we, uh, if we focus on that, rather than fighting in the here and now, what that means is that our working conditions get worse and our living conditions get worse, but not only that, but if 
or when a snap general election is called, or even the next general election, it makes Jeremy Corbyn a lot less likely to get elected because we don't have that atmosphere of struggle. And also, rightly, as... Um, Karen, did I call you Jane? I'm so sorry. As, it's been a long week. As, uh, as Karen said, um, uh, when, you know, when or if Corbyn does get elected, uh, he's, you know, he's likely to get pushed out unless he's got uh, a really strong uh, movement uh, on the streets, in the workplaces, in unions and campaigns supporting him. So, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely inspiring to hear about what happened in Wigan. I'm in the Manchester SWP branch, and I know when the news came around uh, this afternoon, we were all jumping out of our seats uh, to hear that uh, huge setback for the other side and success for us. And, and likewise, the, uh, the UCU strikes of a few months ago that uh, Sean recapped on, you know, I, I know all the Manchester uh, pickets any I went on, you know, fantastically inspiring, energetic, singing, etc., etc. Um, at the same time, we do, we do have a problem, don't we? We do have a problem uh, if you look at the strike figures. Uh, I think last year the figure of people, uh, number of people involved in, uh, 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 number of people involved in strikes was 32,000 last year, which is a bit of an all-time low. Uh, the number of strike days was 270,000, I think. Again, a bit of an all-time low. So we do have a problem. We do have to rebuild and recover. Um, uh, one of the places, actually, you know, if we think, how, how are we going to do this, as well as through our day-to-day uh, -day union work uh, and through raising support for uh, disputes and strikes that, 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 that break out, uh, I think one of the places we can um, re help to rebuild from is by bringing in some of the energy that we're beginning to build in the anti-racist movement into the unions. I mean, basically, the two or three or four people that I asked the other day to sign the statement... Uh, calling for people to demonstrate the stand up to racism uh, statement, uh, calling for support for the demos next, next weekend. They can be the three or four people who would also help me with a strike ballot, uh, uh, going through the names, getting all the details right, etc., etc., if we ever get to the situation of having one. At the same time, the details uh, I don't know if people noticed the figure that um, Len McCluskey. Uh, announced at the uh, Unite conference uh, a few days ago. He said that uh, Unite has held 300 strike ballots in the last two years. So that's about three strike ballots a week. That's quite a lot. He also claimed that uh, uh, most of them had resulted in, in good results for the members. Let's hope so. But a lot of those strikes... Uh, won't a lot of those official Unite ballots, and uh, likewise in my union, Unison, etc., they won't necessarily have turned into, turn, turned into action, and we don't know, what, you know any of the details of what the outcomes were and so on. But it shows that where members are being asked to take action, they are willing to take part and are willing to uh, uh, um, follow the call, if you like. If we talk to some of the people that we're talking to in our unions about coming out to demonstrate against Trump, and, and particularly to combat the real and rising threat of the racists and the fascists. It's not just the urgency of beating back the racists and fascists that has to be done now, but we can use some of that in our unions to try and uh, uh, re-energize and, and rebuild. It, it's not, you know, there aren't two separate movements. We can create an overlap between anti-racism and militant trade unionism. Right. I mean, I think everyone is agreed on the platform, and I suspect everyone in this room, that actually, obviously, the election of Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party did change the British, I don't know, the, the, the zeitgeist of the time, wasn't it? There was hope. That was what was important, because Jeremy Corbyn was very, very bold, and that's why he was able to attract so many new people into the Labour Party, and particularly so many younger people. But I, want, I totally agree with Karen when she said, actually, we need that boldness now, and I don't feel it is there with Corbyn, because I think that at the moment, Corbyn has become, or has allowed himself to become, over the last year, something of a prisoner of the right-wing 
thing in the Labour Party. And really, I mean, people, we can talk and we'll laugh about Brexit, but actually, let's be really clear, inside the Labour Party, there are real divisions about Brexit as well. Uh, the, you know, the right are campaigning against the policies, uh, obviously, that... Anyway, it's a mess, isn't it, for the Labour Party on Brexit. You think about anti-Semitism, the way that the right in the Labour Party have used that. And to be honest, I mean, you know, I know two people who joined M Momentum and the Labour Party, two friends of mine, uh, you know, when, when things were going well, who actually left after the attacks on Gaza e at Easter, when 70-odd people on the first Friday were killed. Why? Because actually there wasn't the confidence of Corbyn to stand up and oppose that in the way that he would have done, I think, prior to the anti-Semitism attacks inside the Labour Party. And my concern is that if he's a... A, a, you know, if he's a captive of the right of the Labour Party at the moment, what the hell is he going to be, actually, when the ruling, if he was in office and the ruling class were at to attack him? I think he has to be bold. And I'll give you an example. I'm in Islington, SWP, and the uh, Islington Council, which is Corbynese to a person, has made a pledge of spending, I can't remember what it was, it's, uh, I don't know, several billion pounds on housing even on their own calculations in Islington that would mean that they built, built 250 council houses when they're next at the, you know after the next election there are 17,000 on the Islington housing waiting list on every corner of every street now there are beggars and homeless people in unprecedented numbers. I think, you know, somebody once said, I can't remember who it was, that politics abhors a vacuum. And if we look at the failure of social democracy across Europe, you know, the, the, the failure of social democratic parties, the failure of neoliberal politics, the problem is, unless he's bold politically with what he's going to promise, and he has to say he's going to tax the rich, he has to say he's going to take on the big corporations and the big bosses, unless he says that, the problem is, it isn't 15,000 fascists marching, actually. It's a tiny number of fascists in a crowd of working-class people who feel they have no hope, no future, and they're no longer part of the system. If we want to win those people away from the right wing, of course we have to protest, but we have to have the politics that promises those people that the Labour government will put people before profit and the rich will pay for the 30, 40 years of Nirvana that they have had at the expense of working class people. Yes, first of all, I, I think the description that Sean gave of the UCU dispute is incredibly important because even against the, the, the miserable backdrop of the level of strikes and so on, when a lead is given that gives some opening to the expression of that bitterness that's accumulated in people, it can be utterly explosive and move much, much faster than even many revolutionary socialists uh, expect. Um, I mean... Sally Hunt, in many ways, the scale of the attack on pensions, by the way, on probably the most conservative part of the union in the old universities, to some extent she had to work with parts of the left against her usual allies who were too cautious to open the door to that dispute. Of course, at some point she vacillates and you have to fight for leadership to push it forward. But the question of leadership is central. And people should know it has an impact. You know, why is it that the PCS union, after an excellent consultative ballot over the fact they're still only being offered 1%, hesitate but are now going and now taking part in a consultative strike ballot. It's, I think it's the impact of the UCU dispute. People should also know that there's rumours swirling around that if the teachers pay offer, which there's talk it could be 2.5%, 3.5%, but unfunded, it has to come from further cuts, this will be explosive. And Kevin Courtney, the General Secretary, is, always, is already saying if they, un, if they offer that, that, there has to be a national ba uh, push for a national ballot. So the potential for this delayed pay revolt does exist. The problem is where there's not a lead, there's a difficulty. Take the question of unison. I mean, Karen was too modest to mention it. There was a fight against the NHS pay deal. Karen did a little video uh, saying why you should reject it. 
uh, to three or four minutes. I think I, you know, we were hoping 10,000 views. I think it got 600,000 views. But because the leadership didn't fight for it, we weren't able to overcome that. So when you go to Unison Conference three weeks ago, you've got a problem. You've got a two-year deal in local government, a three-year deal in national, in national. Just saying national action becomes a bit, it, it's a bit abstract. You've got to say it, but it's... it's Karen's absolutely right. You have to constantly look for ways to shape things. I'll give you three examples from Unison Conference, which are then translatable at a different level into every workplace in Britain. Firstly, um, comrades were involved in inviting John McDonnell to do a meeting, but they didn't just have John McDonnell. They had every dispute that was taking place in Unison at the time, many of which our comrades were involved in. Seven different disputes, raising the question of class struggle. Second example, they got 36 Unison branches and four Unison regions to put on and sponsor a stand-up to racism meeting of 140 people that could put the argument about how you deal with the resurgence of far, and there was an opportunity to build a network around anti-racism inside the union. Third example, there's a debate, and I think there is a question in, in Unison about how to deal with the, the whole argument around Grenfell and the argument about unity and so on with the community. Um, our comrades made sure that there were a thousand of the green for Grenfell scarves on the confluence floor when that to put. And the pictures of it are fantastic. It's a sea of green. People hold them up like football flags. Really creating a sharp class feeling and an argument that has to be unity between workers and the community. In other words, you're shaping things. So when the question arises, how do we pull more people who look to Corbyn? into activity. Part of the answer is there are thousands and thousands, probably millions of them inside the trade unions. That's a key arena for drawing people into strike solidarity, class questions and anti-racism, as well as constantly looking for the opportunity to lead and argue for more struggle. It seems to me it's two souls of socialism. I know we said that uh, many years ago. It's socialism from below, or so, uh, socialism from above, or socialism from below. Now, I've been on the Wigan picket lines, and to me, the potential of the working class can only change the world. And going on them picket lines gives me that optimism that it's only workers who can change the world. We can't rely on the trade union leaders, we can't rely on other people to do it, no MPs, because the, the, when I see them picket lines, even Prentice, our leader, he was pushed to come to Wigan by the strikers themselves, not by groups, by the strikers themselves. And when you get Prentice a bit excited to stand on a wall in Wigan to say, we support you, dispute, things are moving. He gets up and actually was optimistic. How good is that? Is it Wigan strikers that did that? That is, that is the potential of the working class. And when we're marching through Wigan, it was everybody, what I want to be, I want to be seen with them. Everybody wants to be seen with them because they're the ones that are going to change the world. Lisa Nando MP was running to be at the front, running, because she wanted to be seen with them. It was them who forced her, forced her. She'd probably be saying, oh, I supported them, I, I got all the credit, we got the credit, I want a bit of credit, I support it. But no, it's the strikers that did it. I want to be with them. It. It's a fantastic fantastic days in the sunshine, the sun was shining, and I agree with our colleague there, we can win, and only us can win. We've got the potential, I've even heard an Hudson sing, I've never done that before, even that was optimistic on the, on the demonstration. We can win this, well done, it's you who's done it, the working class has done it, and they've done it, and we want to be with you, and everybody else wants to be with you, and we can change the world, and that potential in Wigan is fantastic in my view. <laughs> Okay, um, the thing about the Labour Party that needs to be understood um, is that it's two parties in one. That's the absolute key thing to understand when we're talking about the Labour Party. They're not my words, by the way. Uh, they're the words of Peter Mandelson, if you remember him. Um, that's how we described it. So I think if you've got a section, uh, a group of right-wingers within the Labour Party who consider themselves as a separate party to the various waves of Corbyn support that's come in, then by definition you've got two parties and one. So I think whatever way you approach the Labour Party, that has to be kept in mind. Um, I want to take up the issue about what I think has become a bit of a false dichotomy between sort of like on the streets campaigning and some of the mud wrestling that goes on in the Labour Party, because I think they're actually quite connected. Um, and by doing so, I'll take up um, a bit of an issue that someone raised about the FBU. Um, Next door to Merseyside, where uh, the comrade went to the meeting, is uh, Cheshire. Um, and Cheshire also facing cuts, and um, there's some fire engines that were due to be 
uh, scrapped by a Labour fire authority. Uh, there was a campaign which, you know, was in, in the streets and all that sort of stuff. Um, but in addition, it took the struggle through the Labour Party. And what that meant was they were actually successful in stopping those cuts in Cheshire. They went through the Labour Party, they got four CLPs to uh, uh, object to the Labour Group's proposals. Uh, they put a lot of pressure on the councillors, meetings with the MPs, etc., etc. Laura Smith from Crewe from Crew was uh, particularly supportive. And they ended up having a, a march down to the fire authority where the decisions were going to be made. Uh, and the Labour Group split, because as I say, it's two parties in one. And it, it split to such an extent that the vote was defeated. And just to sort of add the uh, cherry on the top, there was another vote at the same meeting that proposed uh, increasing the councillors' allowances, uh, and due to the pressure, the councillors voted against that one as well. So I'll just bear in mind, just be a little bit careful about how you treat the Labour Party. It's a delicate issue of two parties in one. Don't write the whole thing off and be a little bit ultra-left. Be careful how you operate through it, and if you do have a political strategy of going through the Labour Party, you can actually defeat austerity. Thank you. Um, I just think that there's something that needs to be said in this discussion, and that is that the Labour Party was not set up by the trade unions or working class. It was set up by the trade union leaders in order to represent their interests inside of Parliament. And I think that's a very, very important distinction, because, you see, I was involved in the UCU strike, and pretty much everybody that was in the picket lines wanted to see a Corbyn government. Our General Secretary, who fought to get that strike happening, wants to see a Corbyn government. But that same General Secretary was the same General Secretary that attempted to sell out our strike. And the other thing that you need to remember in terms of, the, the, in terms of what's been happening in recent years, the contradictory pressures on Jeremy Corbyn, you know, the, the demands from the, labor, the trade union leaders that I've heard have by and large not been for more radical policies that represent the interests of our members, such as, for example, abolishing universal credit, uh, which I would love to see Labour commit themselves to, but actually the likes of Len McCluskey demanding that Trident be retained and that actually that's a battle that's been won. I mean, that's, a, that, that's something that none of us want to see. You know, I would much rather see £95 billion pounds spent on their national health service and all these other kind of things. So the point is, is that to remember that the nature of the trade union leaders is about negotiating the terms of exploitation within capitalism and that the distinction that Marxists always make in terms of the, the, the split between politics and economics in British society and other you know, um, 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 societies is one where the trade unions negotiate the terms of the exploitation and perhaps go on strike in order to defend the interests of workers and the Labour Party carries out change on behalf of, of, on behalf of working people from above inside of Parliament. Now that's always been a dangerous contradiction and it's never been one that's produced socialist change from a Labour government. If history is going to be broken then it means that instead of inviting Syriza ministers to come and speak at the World Transformed Conference instead of expecting that Syriza ministers are the kind of people that are going to point to us to the kind of future we want to see we need to be pointing to a different kind of future altogether and saying that the, what happened in Greece and what happened to the Syriza government is a warning for what can happen with the Labour government if it's activists, if it's supporters, if the people that look to it for change are not pre-armed with a different strategy to fight for change from below. Um, I'm now going to bring the um, speakers back in, three minutes each. <laughs> Starting with Sean. Thanks, yeah. Okay, well, thanks. I enjoyed that. It was a great discussion. I just think a um, cu couple of things. What's my ticket? Um, yeah, I mean, I think when we look at Corbyn, I think we, we say this before, but, you know, Corbynism was born out of struggle. It, you know, it wasn't born within the Labour Party, in a sense. You know, he's a reflection of decades of anti-war movements, of anti-austerity movements, of strikes and pickle. He himself has been on, you know, I mean, his constituents have spent many times on platforms and demos with him. He's been on our picket lines and so on. And that's important, isn't it? That we understand where Corbynism comes from and he understands where Corbynism comes from and that's why he campaigned in the way he did. Because I remember the run-up to the election, there was an argument taking place inside the, the Labour Party and you know, before the election or oh, last year and you thought, God, this is going to be disastrous if he doesn't come out. And then clearly he stamped his authority with people like Ian and others, stamping their authority over that argument and he went out campaigning and we know the result which he connected to what he's about. And what's happening now, 
that struggle seems to me is still going on. There are people, there's some around him who believe that will be a disaster. We need to reach wider into the, to, to, to win the election. Therefore, we've got to keep away from the struggle and do uh, different things here, i.e. more of the old uh, type of campaigning. And we, have a, we might not be in the Labour Party, but we can be part of making sure that doesn't happen by ensuring that when we invite Corbyn to every strike and John, which they come, and every demonstration, that make a big difference to our dispute. When John and, and Jer Jeremy speak, it gives confidence to our members to fight and so on and so forth, but also helps us to win an argument inside the Labour Party about let's go that direction rather than the other one. But the final point, I just want to say something about, um, you know, I think uh, Karen said it, you see, it's quite right that we do put pressure and continue to put pressure on our trade union leaders to do something, for Christ's sake, do something, you know, rather than nothing, would be a start, it seems to me. Um, but that's not enough, is it? I mean, if we simply make faces at the trade union bureaucracy, then really we're not about much. We have to try and initiate things, take action to try and make things move. When I think about UCU, it was the left inside UCU, which we obviously are part of, which made that happen. That strike of a pension would not have happened unless we'd organised in union around those issues. It's interesting, the FE stuff, we couldn't get a national strike over pay, so we got 12 colleges to say, right, we're going to do it, ballot us and we'll go for it. We broke through, created a bit of a stir and that then now has led to, that model has now led to, we've got a national ballot in FE over pay and a national ballot over pay in HE. The whole of the union now, both the posh bit, the not so posh bit and the FE bit, completely not posh bit, uh, all united in a ballot which will be throughout August, uh, late August and end of September to come out hopefully in, 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 Oct in October. But, it, but again, that's because we were organised and trying to take initiatives. We didn't simply say, let's just pass motions to have a go at Sally Hunt or the, the right for not organising. Of course you have to do those things, but that's all we're doing. There's a problem. And then we become a barrier, actually, to the mood and anger which ex exists inside our workplaces. Because, as people said, if we are not trying to give direction to, and, and, and formulations of or an organisation to that expression of anger, then others will. More sinister forces, as we know, on the streets of London in a week or so, two's time. So it's not just, just an abstract argument about, oh, should we give it a go? It's crucial that we try and give these things to go. So our experience at UCU, if you want that kind of stuff, I don't believe it's anywhere different. We might not get it nationally, but can we get it in Manchester, right? in unison or wherever it might be. Can we get it in the NUT? One or two places have tried it. Build it up and then you're much got a platform to argue for, an act, for, for national action. Sitting doing nothing, simply making faces is not an alternative at this moment in time. Bring Ian in now. Okay, yeah. Listen, now, there was a lot of stuff in there about, about the Labour Party, but you know, I was trying to emphasise you know, in, in, in what I was saying that the issue really isn't the Labour Party, you know. I mean, as we, can, we can debate, you know, whether Jeremy Corbyn is, you know, captured of the right or, or able to do his own thing. But the reality is that won't change a single thing in any of the communities up and down this country. That won't change people's lives in any way, shape or form. You know, we can, we can talk about whether the Labour Party is going in the right direction or what the history is, but the reality is this. The reality is this. As much as we want to debate in this room, as much as we want to talk about it in this room, as much as we want to talk about, you know, the Labour Party, they're not going to make the change until they're in government. We're the people that will make the change. And anybody who thought I wasn't going to mention the fantastic McStrikers, you know, <laughs> you know between, between your conference last year and this year, I mean, they haven't been on strike once, they've been on strike, but that first strike was made in history. Those were incredible, brave, courageous workers that decided that they were no longer going to accept what life was throwing at, no longer going to accept that they had to have zero hours contracts, no longer going to accept that they had to have low pay and age related minimum wage. They were no longer going to accept bullying and harassment in the workplace. So what they did, they didn't wait for a politician. They said, we're going to join a trade union, we're going to organise and we're going to go on strike because we're going to fight for our rights because we know our history tells us the only change we ever make is not when politicians get elected but when we stand together and we force those politicians to make those changes because the choice is there. They can either listen to us and work with us or get out the way because we will remove them. Don't put your hopes and aspirations in politicians. Put your hopes and your aspirations in each other. Stand together in solidarity. And that's how we win. Impossible is nothing when we stand together. Solidarity. <laughs> On a slightly
slightly disagree with Sean because I do think that Corbyn came out of the massive attacks on living standards that Labour did in no way try to, to articulate and showed no stand of cha chance of changing, partly because they became unelectable because they offered so little difference to the Tories and partly because they offered so little difference to the Tories. I think that the frustration of that, that sort of Labour Party not delivering, when Corbyn said, I will deliver this, I think he was a beacon of hope to people who just had enough up to here as they were attacked more and more and more each year. And I think he came out of those betrayals of Blair Brown and uh, and Miliband combined with the attacks and, uh, that we've seen from the government that Labour were doing nothing uh, to resist. And I do think Jeremy Corbyn makes a difference. You know, Jeremy Corbyn was due to come down to the next Wigan strike and it would have made a difference that you'd had a Labour leader on a picket line, happily on a picket line. It makes a difference that John McDonnell says he's happy to be on picket lines that Diane Abbott does. It's a very different Labour party. Can you imagine Blair ever being on a picket line? And it makes picket lines more legitimate. It legitimises them. It makes you feel it's okay, it's normal, it's what we should do and it does make a difference and the more Jeremy Corbyn is stuck between what he wants to do, which he wants to be on pickets, he wants to be on demonstrations, he wants to be on those fights but he also wants to be in government and he worries if he does too much of that then the people who are on the right will argue against him so he needs to hold back and there's a balance going on and what we can do is we can make a difference to shift the balance that helps to pull him further to the left and we can do that just like the way that sort of you know that Mark described at Unison Conference where we have to help to shift the balance in some ways on some of the debates that made the conference a more left-wing conference and in a way we passed motions at Unison Conference we defeated a motion on having a 25-year review we are having a 25-year review whether you would vote for it or not because the officials are going to do it you know we passed other motions about doing things that we won't do unless people actually vote uh, mobilized to do them and I think it's about how do we make motions turn into reality how how do we make governments, great governments with great policies, turn into reality, not just by electing them? Because if you do that, that isn't how you turn them into reality. The Cheshire example I thought was really interesting because it wasn't that they just passed motions at the Labour Party. He talked about demonstrations, he talked about lobbying, he talked about campaigning and he talked about organising. When you do that, yes, Labour Party motions and governments and councillors will shift and that's the lesson you have to learn. If you just do the motions, then it ends up, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a Labour government that, that repealed the poll tax, it was a Tory government because they'd had enough of not enough of us paying in the huge demonstrations and the antagonism. So we can win things off people by the balance of forces and we make a difference and it is a problem that there isn't enough strike action. It is a problem that there isn't enough class struggle. It's a real problem for us. But we can end up being a victim of that and thinking there's nothing you can do when it's not true. We can make a difference of shifting the activity to the left. We can go to, and it's not the case that you always win it, but you can go to the Labour Party members and say there's a Trump demo. You can say I've got two or three people from the college and they want to do a stall. I know you've got your AGM, but will you at least help us with the stall and actually begin to get them to see that there's a mood out there against Trump that you want to build, that there's an alternative to what is probably a dreary, boring AGM. Having been in the Labour Party for 10 years, it was boring and shit and didn't achieve anything, to be fair. But you know, whereas you go on the Trump demo and I think everyone who goes on it will feel 10 foot tall and we'll feel more confident and that's the difference that it makes it makes a difference to the balance of, of struggle to whether Corbyn can be the Corbyn that he wants to be or the Corbyn that the right wing want him to be and there's a fight about which one he is and it isn't about his personal strength or his personal character although that does make a bit of difference what does make the real difference is how much we can make him be the person and it's us organising and we can do those little things that taking the anti-racism petition round the organising the having an agitating meeting, let's do an open letter to the management about a little thing that they're trying to do, let's always try and push the bar and we can do those things and we need to not think that we have to wait for class struggle to hit us in the eye it's interesting, at Unite Conference um, Len McCluskey said, the elite in this country has cause to be worried, Unite's capacity to conduct industrial action is still the most important thing, however we have developed new ways to win, such as legal action, but actually they're opening the door to some extent and I think we have to say national action is more difficult because it's hard to to beat the trade union laws but local action you can be and there is an opening in some of the big unions that are much more right wing and I think we get cowed and think that there's no point when there is a point and you can do it. Wigan didn't happen because Dave Prentice wanted it to happen Wigan happened because people like Dave said I'm not going to work for a private company and spoke and organised to the other people and I think that's what we have to do more of and we have to advertise the people who win.
Apologies.